Today we're going to continue learning about solving limits algebraically. We're going to learn some new techniques. Mainly we're looking at piecewise functions, some, out, some trigonometric functions, and something called the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem. So first, let's talk about solving piecewise, uh, finding limit of piecewise functions. Now, if the limit, if I'm doing the limit as x approaches a number, and that number is inside, completely enclosed within one piece of the piecewise function, I do it like normal. But if it happens to be the, P, um, the number that I'm looking at, like in this example, A, I'm looking for x equals 3. And 3 is where I divide up to the two pieces. If that occurs, what you do is you have to find the limit from the left and the limit from the right. So I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x. Now, if I'm doing the limit as x approaches 3 from the left, that's x values that are less than 3 but close to 3. And so that's going to be the top function. So I'm going to write the top function in here. And I think I can do this with direct substitution. And so I get an answer of 2. Now, I'm not done because a limit has to approach the same value from the left and from the right. So now I'm going to move to the right of 3. So I'm going to take the limit as f approaches the right of 3 of um, f of x. And then according to my directions of my piecewise function, that is the bottom equation. And again, I'm going to try direct substitution. And that gives me 9 minus 7, which is just 2. Now, since the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x is the same value as the limit as x approaches 3 from the right of f of x, my conclusion is that the limit of x approaches 3 of f of x exists, and it is 2. So that's kind of how you do it when you're looking at the two different techniques there. Now, an absolute value problem requires you to do to convert the, the absolute value equation into a piecewise function. So basically what you have to do is remember that the absolute value uh, function, if you think about the graph of the absolute value function, this is just the absolute value of x graph. And then if I'm looking at this left-hand side, that is just y is equal to negative x. And if I look at the right-hand side, that's the equation y is equal to x. So I'm using the equation y is equal to negative x when x was less than or equal to 0. And I'm using the equation y equals x when x is greater than 0. And so that's my definition of the basic, the parent function, the absolute value graph. Now we're going to do the same thing with um, any absolute value graph. And so instead of having to draw the picture each time, what you can do to kind of remember how to do it is anytime you see a limit function of an absolute value graph, first thing you want to do is you want to find the piecewise function that corresponds to this absolute value. To do that, you take whatever's inside the absolute value, set it equal to zero, and solve. This is where your two pieces diverge. So one's going to be x is um, less than or equal to 1, and the other equation is going to be when x is greater than 1. Now, I could have said, just as easily, I could have said this is where x is less than 1 when the second equation was x is greater than or equal to 1. doesn't matter which of these two equations you, you said equal to the negative 1, sorry, not 1, to the negative 1. It just has to be only one, because if you set both of them equal to it, you don't have a function, so you have two points at the same spot, um, two points um, at that same x value. So we want to only include it once, but you have to decide which one to include. So now i got to decide, what is my equation? Well, just like with the parent function, I had negative x and, and uh, regular x. One equation is going to be what is it, whatever is inside my absolute value, and the other equation is going to be the opposite of whatever is inside my absolute value. And to help me decide which of these two it is, I just substitute in a value. So the top equation is when x is less than negative 1. And so I'm going to plug in something smaller than negative 1, say negative 2. And if I plug it into the bottom equation, and you do this in your head, I get a negative value. But I know absolute value, by definition, can always give me a positive. So that can't work. But when I plug it in to this equation... I get a positive value. So that tells me when numbers are less than negative 1, I need the opposite of whatever's inside my absolute value. 
And when numbers are greater than or equal to negative one, I just need what's inside my absolute value. So that's kind of how the process of thinking through it. It's very, this right here, what I have on the page right now is all the really work that you need to show for this. So now I've set this up and I have two pieces. I'm gonna take my limit and I'm also gonna divide that limit into two. I'm gonna do the limit as X approaches negative one from the left. And if I'm doing it from the left, in place of that absolute value, I'm gonna use the equation for when X is less than negative one. So that's gonna be negative X plus one over X plus one. Now let me simplify that a little bit. So that gives me negative four times x plus one. Notice I didn't bother multiplying it out. The reason I didn't do that is I knew I was gonna cancel something out. So I'm asked the limit as x approaches negative one to the left is just simply negative four, and the limit of a constant is that constant. So our limit is equal to negative four. Now that I've done the limit from the left, next I'm gonna do the limit as x approaches negative one from the right. Now, in place of the absolute value, I want to plug in my bottom equation because I'm looking now when x is greater than negative 1 over x plus 1. I want to simplify this down to get rid of that indeterminate form. And I get 4, and my answer is 4. Now, in this case, notice that my limit from the left is not equal to my limit from the right. So my conclusion is the limit as x approaches negative one of four times the absolute value of x plus one over x plus one does not exist. It's a limit from the left, it's not equal to the limit from the right. But the key is with absolute value, make a piecewise function, do the limit from the left, do the limit from the right, compare your results. Next we're gonna learn um, a couple of special trigonometric identities that you just need to have memorized. The first one is the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x divided by x. Now, if I did direct substitution, I plug in zero in place of sine. I know from uh, trig class, the sine of zero degrees is zero. And that's so I have zero over zero. This is an indeterminate form. There's a big process of formulas to go through to get this simplified down. But for our purposes right now, and our knowledge, we're, I'm just going to give you what it's equal to. It is equal to 1. Um, you can research this if you want to online to find out how this happens. And what's really cool, not only is the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x equal to 1, I can use any constant as long as the constant inside the trig function that I'm multiplying the x by is the same constant then I'm multiplying the x by the denominator that's outside the trig function. So as long as those values are the same, we get the same result, which is pretty cool. And then likewise, if I'm looking at cosine, the limit as x approaches zero of the cos of one minus the cosine of x divided by x is equal to zero. And if, again, inside the trig function, if I multiply x by some number and, and the denominator I multiply x by that same number, then it's, it still fits the same formula. One minus the cosine of m of x divided by m of x is still zero. So let's try this. Um, so here I have the limit as x approaches zero, a tangent of x over x. Well, first thing you say is, wait, that's not any of those identities that we have. So a lot of times you have to use your trig identities to do some simplifying. So I recall that um, tangent of x is the same as sine of x divided by cosine of x. So I'm gonna rewrite tangent of x as sine of x divided by cosine of x. And then I'm going to recall that x is the same as x over one. So I have a fraction divided by a fraction. So to do that, I'm gonna flip the bottom fraction and multiply. And now I'm going to choose to write this as the limit as x approaches zero of the sine of x over x times one over cosine of x. Okay, now the reason I did that is I wanted to get this to look like my formula up here. Okay, now I can use my properties of limits, and this is the same as the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of x over x times by the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over cosine of x. Now, by definition, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is 1. 
and the lemon is x approaches zero of one over cosine of x. Well, I can just do direct substitution here, one over cosine of zero radians. Um, cosine of zero, I remember is um, one. And so one over one is one. So I have one times one, which of course is just one. And that's how you solve that problem. This one, the problem is that the constant that I'm multiplying x by inside and outside are not the same. If they were the same, it would be perfect, that second formula. So I need to make those the same. And to do that, I'm going to do the trick of multiplying by 1. And I'm going to choose to write my 1. Notice I need 3 um, times the x. So I'm going to choose to multiply this by 3 over 3. And that's just 1, so I'm not changing the problem. And now I'm going to rewrite this as sine of 3x over 3x, putting the 3 and the x together, times by 3 over 2, putting what I don't need for the formula off to the side. And remember, if we're multiplying by a constant, 3 halves is just a constant. That's the same as 3 halves times the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 3x over 3x, which is just 3 halves times 1, or 3 halves. So using a lot of different things that we've learned so far, some previous skills from trig and these two identities. All right, the last thing we're going to learn today is the squeeze theorem, or some books call it the sandwich theorem. It means the same thing. So if you have basically the kind of visual of what's happening here, let's say you have one function. We'll call this one f of x. And you have another function. We'll call this g of x. Okay. And then somewhere you have this weird function, this function that doesn't follow any of the rules we saw we solved so far, that you can't evaluate using any of the techniques that we learned. So let's say we have a function that maybe looks something like this and going like that. So some sort of weird function here. I can use the squeeze theorem to figure out the limit as x approaches this value right here where they're kind of squeezed in between. Okay. Now basically the rule says if you have one function, our g of x function, g of x is less than or equal to, and we'll call the function that we're trying to find h of x. h of x, which is less than or equal to f of x. So the red function is always above our h of x function, and the green function is always below our h of x function, near in the neighborhood of the x that we're trying to reach, which is x equals a. That, that x value for all x in the interval containing a except oh I'm sorry I use c so let me change that to c except for at c itself and if the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals L, which is equal to the limit as X approaches C of F of X. So if the limit as X approaches the C of the top function and the bottom function are the same value, then the limit as X approaches C of, I change this to H of X, H of X is, exist, and it is also equal to L. So we're gonna use those other functions to solve this. So there's two main ways that you'll see this. So the first one, we're going to use the squeeze theorem to find the limit as x approaches c of f of x, given that c is equal to 0, and 9 minus x squared is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to 9 plus f of x. So this f of x has been squeezed in between these two functions. So there I kind of set up our inequality. So we have 9 minus x squared, which is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to 9 plus x squared. 
So to figure, find the limit as x approaches c of f of x, I'm just going to take the limit as x approaches 0 in this case, and c equals 0, of the outside fun the left-hand function, the limit as is less than or equal to limit as x approaches 0 of f of x, which is less than or equal to limit as x approaches 0 of 9 plus x squared. And then I think I can do direct substitution on this outside. I don't know what f of x is, so I can't actually do anything to the middle function. But I think I can do direct substitution on this um, last function. And that gives us 9, which is less than or equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x, which is less than or equal to 9. So if it's less than or equal to 9 or greater than and less than or equal to 9 or greater than or equal to 9, the only possibility is by the squeeze theorem. The limit as x approaches 0 of f of x must be 9. And then that's how you do it. More often, you're going to see one like the second example here, where you say you find the limit as x approaches c of the absolute value of x times sine of x. Now, if I plugged in to direct substitution, I got 0 times well, sine of zero, sine of x is 0, so 0 times 0, which is one of those other forms of the indeterminate form. So that doesn't work, but there's not any algebra. Sine is already simplified as much as I can. If I do the piecewise, the opposite of 0 is still 0. It's not going to help me any. And so I'm going to try to do the squeeze theorem. So I'm going to break this down to the simplest function I can look at. So I'm going to start with sine of x. And I'm going to say, okay, can I bound sine of x between two functions? Well, yes, we know sine of x bounces up and, up and down between negative 1 and 1. So I know negative 1 is always less than or equal to sine of x, which is always less than or equal to 1. Okay, so that's our starting point. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this statement inside this middle by doing whatever I need to. So I notice I have the sine of x, and then I need to multiply the sine of x by, negative, by the absolute value of x. So I need to multiply sine of x by the absolute value of x. But what I do to that inside, I have to also do to the outside. And what I do to one side, I got to do to the other side. So I end up with this statement. Now, I still don't have what I'm trying to find. So now I'm going to do the limit of each of these terms. So, as you recall, the absolute value of x is negative x when x is less than or equal to 0, and x when x is greater than 0. So, to find the absolute value of negative absolute value of x, that means I'm going to just do the limit as x goes to 0 from the left-hand side, which would be opposite of negative, negative x which is just x, and x is 0, so that gives us 0, and the limit as x goes to 0 from the right is opposite of x, which is negative x, which is negative 0, which is also 0. So that gives us 0. Now, I'm not going to show that work on this one, but you can kind of work out that the limit as x approaches 0 of the absolute value of x is also 0. So, so by the squeeze theorem... spelling that better. And the squeeze or sandwich theorem. We know that the limit as x approaches 0, the absolute value of x times sine of x must be 0. And that's how you do the squeeze theorem. And that's it for today's video.